Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Happy Lord's Day. And um, welcome back, Brother Ed Rivera. So our uh, topic for this morning, uh, we will continue with our My Lord and My God series. And uh, this morning we will be talking about My Lord and My God, the resurrection. It's something about the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, um, the last time I stood before you, we talked about in the book of John, chapter 20, regarding Thomas. Now, while it is true that Thomas doubted when Jesus appeared to the 10 uh, apostles, the question is that was he the only one who really doubted? Was Thomas the only one that doubted Jesus Christ? Now, whenever we would be able to to, to ask in the Bible trivia, uh, the question, who doubted in the Bible? The first thing, the first thing that comes to mind is Thomas, right, Thomas. Now, <clears throat> but let us see some facts in the Bible and maybe we can have a, a, a change of heart, so to speak, about Thomas. Now, first let me go to uh, Luke chapter 24, verses 5 to 12. Now the man said to them, Why are you seeking the living one among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen, saying that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise from the dead. And they remembered his words and reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now these women were Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary, the mother of James. But these words appeared to them as nonsense, and they would not believe the women. Nevertheless, Peter got up and ran to the tomb, and when he stooped and looked in, he saw the linen wrappings only. And he went away to his home, marveling at what had happened. Not only Thomas doubted, but when the woman went to the tomb and they reported it to the disciples, to the apostles, they didn't believe these women. So Peter got up and ran to the tomb to see for himself. Now another account in verses 36 to 41 in Luke chapter 24. Now while they were telling these things, Jesus himself suddenly stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought that they were looking at a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you frightened? And why are doubts arising in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me. And see, because a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you plainly see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. <clears throat> while they stood, while, while they still could not believe it, because of their joy and astonishment, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? Again, not only Thomas doubted. But all of them doubted. Now, when Jesus showed himself to, uh, to the ten, Jesus knew they were doubting him. And uh, so what Jesus did was to show them his hands and his feet. Okay? And he let them touch them so that uh, their doubts would be erased. Now, Thomas... His, his, his doubt, I would like to believe, was not a doubt if Jesus had risen from the dead, but one that more of confirmatory. You know, if Jesus was the one that showed up with the ten apostles. Because when the apostles told Thomas that they saw Jesus, they never said to him that Jesus let 
that Jesus touched his uh, hands and his feet and his wounds. They never said that to Thomas. So for Thomas, it was like, yeah, right, Jesus showed to you. But, you know, that could be an imposter. You know? And uh, that would be imposter who looks like Jesus. And to make sure it was Jesus, you know, here's what I will do. Uh, I would touch his wounds. I will try to see if there would be wounds in his hands, feet, and his side. And I will touch them to see if that Jesus that you're telling me is the real Jesus. <clears throat> now in Matthew 24, 23 and 24, at that time, anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is. Do not believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders that would deceive even the elect. Even the elect. Even if that <clears throat> were possible. So for Thomas, well, the person that showed to the dead would probably be an imposter. Because anybody can claim that that person, or I am Jesus. And it is easy to claim to be Jesus. Now, as far as Thomas was concerned, if that person claims to be Jesus, the only way to be sure of it is through his wounds. Now, <clears throat> what would make the real resurrected Christ different from the imposters were his wounds? Because imposters, they won't have that wounds like Jesus had. So it was more of confirmatory. Now, those would be a proof that that person that showed to the ten truly was Jesus. Just like why we believe what we believe. Because there's a biblical proof to it. So there's always a proof. Now, with that said, it is common to hear claims at being the truth. We hear that oftentimes. We are the truth especially when it comes to religious beliefs. People would say, we have the truth, we are the truth, so on and so forth. Now, if we would claim that Christianity is the only true way, now others can make that same claim, right? About their beliefs being the true way. But the bottom question is, what makes Christianity different? If everybody is telling us that they are the truth and we are the truth, as we claim, then what makes Christianity different? Resurrection made Christianity different, unique. The resurrection, particularly, from other religious groups. Now, I would, I would like to show some names of uh, other uh, beliefs. Okay. Siddhartha Gautama, also known as Buddha, died eight years old. He was cremated. His ashes were buried in different locations. Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Ad Muthalib ibn Hashim, also known as Prophet Muhammad, died 62 years old. Buried in the Green Dome in Medina, Saudi Arabia. Konki, Confucius, also known as Confucius, died 72 years old. Uh, cemetery of Confucius in Kufu, Shandong, China. His remains are still there. Ron Al Hubbard, the founder of Scientology, died 74 years old, cremated, and his ashes were scattered in the Pacific Ocean. You see, many other religious beliefs they don't believe in the crucifixion and more so the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, assuming Jesus died in a different way other than the crucifixion, the fact of the matter remains his body was nowhere to be found. Now, all of these names that I've showed you, their remains are still in their tombs. They were never resurrected. 
Except, of course, for the last one, Ron Hubert, because his, his remains were scattered, um, his ashes were scattered in the Pacific Ocean. Now, historical facts, records are overwhelming of Jesus' proof that he was seen alive after three days. He was resurrected. And this is the primary reason his body was never found and can never be found, for he was indeed resurrected. Even if we go now to where he was buried, you can never see his body. Nowhere to be found. In John chapter 20, verses 6 to 9, he entered the tomb and saw the linen cloth lying there. Peter, after the women reported to them, to the apostles, about Jesus' resurrection, Peter went to the tomb and saw the linen cloth lying there. The cloth had been around. Jesus' head was rolled up, lying separate from the linen cloth. Then the other disciples also went in, and he saw and believed. For they still did not understand from the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. In verses 15 and 16, women, why are you weeping? Jesus asked, whom are you seeking? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him off, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Now Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Wherever you look at it, whichever angle you will look at it, you will never find, and they will never find Jesus' remains. Because Jesus was resurrected. When Peter went to the tomb, he never saw any bones or any skin or hair or whatever that left off uh, Jesus Christ because Jesus was resurrected. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 5 and 6, and that he was seen by Peter and then by the 12 apostles, after that Jesus was seen by more than 500 of the believers at the same time. And this was the very reason why Jesus had to be seen by many individuals not only by his uh, the apostles, but other believers as well, so that they will be the witness, witnesses for the resurrected Christ. As it was prophesied that on the third day, Jesus would be resurrected. So that is the main difference of what we claim to be the true way the true so to speak religion than those of other belief system because we have a christ we have jesus that was resurrected we have a lord and savior that was resurrected and those other people that i've showed you a while ago they were never resurrected and that's the main difference and without the resurrection christianity would crumble number one our faith is useless. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 14, And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless. And your faith is useless. In the Greek word, kinos, it means good for nothing, worthless, as in no value, false. You know, I remember just like the salt in the Bible, when it loses its saltiness, loses its saltiness, it will be good for that thing. Right? You, you can just throw it away and trample the pond. It is worthless, no value at all. Now, imagine your, your trash, your, <clears throat> your plastic garbage for recycling. It has value, correct? It has value. Now, so your plastic garbage has more value and benefits than your faith if Jesus had not been resurrected. 
correct? Because your faith will be useless. Then your garbage for recycling is, has more value than your faith if Jesus again had not been resurrected. Imagine that. And then it says, false. All your life, you believe in something that isn't real at all. That isn't true. And if you believe something that it isn't true, what that makes you? What that makes us? A fool. Our faith is the very foundation of our response to the central belief system of Christianity. It is that very foundation. It is through this faith that we can be pleasing to God. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Now, notice the word please or pleasing. Now, it means gratified. Or in, in a more shallow term, happy. Okay. To be pleasing to God. To be gratifying to God. And our faith, it is what makes God happy. It is what makes Him smile. Because of your faith. And this is done by giving what is accepted to God alone. And what is acceptable to God is our faith. You see, it is impossible to please God without what? Without faith. Now, not only that God is gratified by your faith, but God is glorified because of your faith. And that's why whatever we do, it is impossible to make him happy, to make him smile without faith. Now remember that the Christian life is a life of faithfulness to God. In Romans chapter 1, 17, For the gospel reveals the righteousness of God that comes by faith from start to finish. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. For the righteous, or for the righteousness of God, according to, to this verse, is revealed in the gospel. Now again, what is the gospel? What is the gospel? Well, specifically, this is the, the life of Jesus Christ. And when we talk of the life of Jesus Christ, of course, it starts with his birth. His birth, his ministry, his death, his burial, including his suffering, and his resurrection. And in this gospel, according to this verse, that righteousness of God is revealed to us all. And now you ask, what is the righteousness of God? What is that righteousness of God? Now the righteousness of God is who God is. Who God is. His very nature. You know, God being God. That's part of his righteousness. It is his character. Part of that character is his love. His mercy, his long-suffering, his patience, his grace, and his justice. And you will come to know who God really is through what? Through faith. Because through faith, and in the gospel, that righteousness of God, that character of God, who God is, is revealed to you through the gospel because of what? Because of your faith. And without faith, you know, all of these things will crumble to the ground. Because again, our faith is the foundation <clears throat> of our central, of that central belief system in, in Christianity. Now, let us examine for a while a Romans 117. This Romans 117 was a quote from uh, Habakkuk, in the book of Habakkuk, in chapter 2, verse 4. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. New King James Version. Look at the proud, they trust in themselves and their lives are crooked, but the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. New Living Translation. Now, this was in reference to the great empire of Babylon during that time. Because Babylon was the greatest empire during that time in the Old Testament. 
Now, since they've grown so proudly to a great empire, I mean, they became proud in front of God. They live according to their own wishes. They live according to their own desires and follow their own lust. Now, in contrast, the righteous would live by faith in God. Those who are boastful, those who are arrogant, will never live, you know, in faith or with faith in God. But the humble will live by faith in God, meaning they are humble and they would live within the midst and bounds of God's precepts. And, you know, with gratitude in their hearts, they would be grateful for all of God's provisions. So a righteous person will live by faith. Next, if there would be no resurrection, we are still guilty of sins in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 17, and 18. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. We proclaim that the forgiveness of sins is only through Jesus Christ. Correct? Therefore, only in Christianity that a person could be saved through Jesus Christ and with that of his resurrection. Now, if there is no resurrection of Jesus, all these claims are simply what it is. Just a claim. No truth to it. Therefore, we will forever live in our sins and just die. In Romans chapter 6, 3 and 4, regarding the uh, baptism and the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, aren't we teaching these verses? Aren't we teaching this truth? And what are we talking about here? In Romans chapter 6. This is a direct relationship between the resurrection and the forgiveness of our sins. Now, you see the words, just as Christ was raised from the dead, just as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Now, living a new life means that life's, your life, your sins have been forgiven. And that you know the way to eternity. You are not a lost soul. You are not wandering around, doesn't know where to go or doesn't have any clue where to go. But because of the resurrection of Jesus, you have the forgiveness of sins and you have that knowledge of the way to eternity. Now, this would be nonsense if there would be no resurrection, all of these things. There is no new life, there is no forgiveness, and again, we will just die and cease to exist. The next one, if there will be no resurrection, we are to be pitied. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 19, and if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. Now, question, do you know why Paul said that we are to be pitied than anyone in the world if our hope in Christ is only in this life? Because number one, it means we are wasting our time trying to teach and trying to reach out to people. And that would be foolishness. We are wasting our time. We are wasting our energy if there would be no resurrection. Number two, it means we are just a bunch of nonsense individuals. If there is no resurrection from the dead. Romans 8, 24, 25, for in this hope we, we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. You see, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. 
correct? If our faith in Christ would only give us hope in this life, which we can already see and feel, then this is no hope at all. Now then the next sentence tells us, who hopes for what they already have. It is without saying that only a fool or a nonsense person would do that. Hoping in something that doesn't even exist is foolishness. Number four, if there would be no resurrection, we, God, and Jesus would be a liar. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 15. And we, apostles, would only be lying about God. For we have said that God raised Christ from the grave, but that can't be true if there is no resurrection of the dead. Not only the apostles, but all of us, because we proclaim that Jesus Christ was indeed risen from the dead. Now, if there would be no, if there would be no resurrection, then we would be lying along with the apostles. In Matthew 17, verse 22 and 23, And while they were gathering together in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. And they were deeply grieved. Now, if Jesus wasn't resurrected, then Jesus would be lying. Because Jesus said, he will be raised on the third day. If there's no resurrection, Jesus then is a liar. In Psalm chapter 16, 9 and 10, Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure. Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful, faithful ones see decay. Now this prophecy pertains to Jesus Christ. That he will not be abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor you would see decay. And this is God foretelling the resurrection of Jesus Christ through David. Now, if there's no resurrection, that makes God a liar. This leads me to my next point. Number five. If God is a liar, Jesus is a liar, there is no God. And he is not God. In Titus 1-2, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time begun. Now, our God is not a liar. But if there is no resurrection, he is not God. Because that would make him a liar. The verse also reveals to us that the hope of eternal life was promised. It was in the mind of God before the beginning of time. Eternal life can, all, can only be achieved through the resurrection. Now, if this resurrection is not true, then all of what we are talking about, our faith will be a big, one big lie. Now, even God is a lie. But of course, we know that the, res the resurrection is real, and God is real. In Romans 8, 11, it tells us, The Spirit of God, who raised Jesus from the dead, lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, He will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. My next point, if there would be no resurrection, let us drink and be merry, for tomorrow we die. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 32, and if there's no resurrection, let's feast and drink, for tomorrow we die. Now, when there's no resurrection, these two things happen. This will happen, number one. There is no reason for moral excellence. If there's no resurrection, there's no reason for moral excellence. I can be morally good. Again, I can be morally good when somebody is looking, when you are looking. 
But evil, when nobody is looking, as long as I am doing my part, my obligations to my family, providing for them, for their provision, whatever, and whatever means, you know, I employ to get those provisions, again, whatever means, be it good or evil, whatever means I employ to gain those provisions for them, as long as they are, they are well provided, that's good enough. That is good enough. There's no reason for moral excellence. So as long as they are happy, it doesn't matter how I get those provisions because there is no need for moral excellence if there is no resurrection. Number two, the value of humanity ceases. If there is no resurrection, the value of humanity ceases. Why? I can go out and just kill someone as long as I am not caught by the police because there would be no resurrection. As long as I can get, you know, uh, I can get away with the arms of the law, right? I can keep on stealing, I can keep on killing people and get away with it. You see, when there is no reason for moral excellence, you know, number three, there's no question about conscience or guilt. Why should I be guilty? Why should, why should I be, you know, be bothered by my conscience? And with that, I can have so many affairs as I can and still look okay and still be good because there is no need for me to be guilty because there is no resurrection. And because there is no resurrection, it means there's no judgment. There's no judgment. And in doing these things, I trample on, I step on the value of humanity if there would be no resurrection. Everybody will just do whatever pleases them. Again, be merry. Eat and drink to your heart's desire for tomorrow will just be another day without conscience, without guilt and judgment. That shows how our life would be. You know, without the resurrection. The confession of Thomas, my Lord and my God, it affirms the prophecy of the resurrection of Jesus. It affirms the Godship of Jesus. It affirms that God is real. It affirms the truthfulness of judgment, that there is heaven and that there is hell. And it affirms Christianity as the only true way. We must rejoice. We must be glad because Christ was risen from the dead. Amen to that. Rejoice because you died with Christ through baptism and you will be resurrected. You will be, you will live with Christ through his resurrection. Now the Bible tells us, you know, when I learned about this, I was so so happy. I was, you know, so glad <laughs> in a way. Because the Bible tells us in John chapter 20, 29, then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, he was talking to Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those, happy are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Have you seen Jesus Christ? Have anybody here seen Jesus Christ? Saw Jesus Christ? Nobody, right? We have not seen Jesus Christ. But Jesus said, blessed are you, happy are you, because you believe without seeing Jesus Christ. So be happy. Rejoice with your heart because you have that faith in you. You believe in Jesus Christ even though you have not seen him. Now let us declare, my Lord and my God with pride, with pride. I think yesterday, before I end, yesterday or two days ago, I've watched a, a, in the Philippines, a mass parade. Um, it was, uh, they, 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 the news told that, uh, told us that it's that the people, 
that in that parade was around 200,000 or 20,000. Uh, let me figure out. People paraded with pride the, the LGBTQ plus plus plus. They parade with pride. If they are parading with pride, let us all the more with pride in our hearts, rejoicing, declaring, telling to our friends that Jesus indeed is alive, that Jesus indeed is the true God. Jesus indeed is the Christ, the resurrected Christ, the Messiah, the Savior. Let us be, be proud of that. Even though we have not seen him, we believe. And Jesus said, you are blessed. And be proud of that. This is our victory in Jesus, his resurrection. We are victorious because Jesus was resurrected. Now, brethren and friends, if you want to have that victory in Jesus, those who have not yet come to Jesus, the biblical way, we call upon you to come forward and reap the glory of Jesus' resurrection. Why delay until tomorrow? Here's water. Repent and be baptized into Jesus. Now, for those who already accepted Jesus, may I humbly ask you continue to continue in Jesus and never let him go. Be proud of your faith. Be proud, proud of who you are. Be proud of being a servant of Jesus Christ. Be proud as you are a Christian. Shall we all stand as we sing the song of invitation? Good morning.